get started with the session. Uh, let me introduce uh, my colleague, Stacy Sedbrook. Stacy's um, vice president, and she runs our strategic sales um, practice area, among other things. Uh, this session is tapping the power of co-op dollars, market development funds, brand networks, whatever we call it. There's a bunch of money there, and we're going to learn how it flows, how it works, and, and some things about what's coming up next. Uh, so, Stacy, let me turn this over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So, we're uh, going to play Russian roulette with the microphones. We'll see which one is working for this session. This one seems to be, so if I have to pass it along, I will. Uh, we have spent the day talking about brands and how important local marketing is to brands. So, this session, we're actually going to talk about the funding for brands and where the brands find the money to fund some of these opportunities. I will be asking each of these uh, gentlemen a, a, a couple questions uh, about who they are, what they do, and what their companies do. But I think um, one of the key takeaways from here is that the co-op opportunity has been sized anywhere between 36 billion and 70 billion. There's no consensus on what that number is, but we do know that if we categorized all of the unused dollars as an ad category, it would rank in the top 10. So before I ask a few questions of these three gentlemen, I want to share a data point with you. So there's obviously a large opportunity with co-op dollars. Who are the people who are smart enough to be taking advantage of these dollars? Based on our most recent LCM survey, plus spenders, which we define as people who spent more than $25,000 annually, about 40% of SMBs are taking advantage of co-op programs. So I want to tee this. Uh, I want to tee this up with you guys. First, if you can tell me uh, your name, company you work for, what you do, and then talk to me about that number. Is that a good number? Do you feel like that's pretty representative? And that how do we increase that number so that it, we don't have so many unused dollars? And Tim, I think I'll start with you. Hi, my name is Tim Brennan. I work for a company called Recast. We provide. Um, we host a database of co-op advertising programs available in the United States and provide more or less a consultancy and services to, uh, to local media to try to capture those dollars. As to that figure, um, as with most figures, it's, well, where did that actually come from and how was that derived? If you look at the, the spending patterns of small businesses with co-op advertising, it's a catch-all of guys who know what they're doing to guys who don't know what they're doing with whatever selection of brands they have. So you may have an Ace Hardware store that carries Snapper Lawn Mowers, Benjamin Moore Paints, Sanderson Windows. That's four different programs he has to try to master, and that can be a challenge. Okay, wonderful. Steve. Hello, uh, my, sorry. I'm Steve Duma. I'm the Senior Director of Strategy at Pair. And um, Pair is a grassroots marketing platform that enables brands to sponsor local groups at scale. So we have a, a very large network, millions of groups around the country, anything from sports to academics, family groups, friend groups, et cetera. And we connect those groups with sponsor brands who want to engage with them. Um, as far as your question, I mean, it's, I think it's probably almost impossible to ever put a specific pin in the number and say it's exactly this number, but clearly it's in that range of many billions of dollars. There's a lot of money floating out there. Um, and I think a lot of the challenge is just trying to align all the different interests of the different groups that are involved between the corporate level, setting the brand strategy, national level strategy, bringing that down to the grassroots level, trying to activate at the local level. Um, and I think there's also an element of, you know, how risk averse are you? What, right. you know, level of sophistication do you have? And how willing are you to try new things versus the tried and true? Okay. And Brendan? Hi there, Brendan Morrissey, uh, CEO and co-founder of a company called NetSertive. Uh, NetSertive is a technology platform that fundamentally empowers large national brands to harmonize their marketing with their local affiliates. Uh, we do that through you know, cross uh, digital channels for them and, dr and drive a sort of turnkey enterprise-like capability down into those micro programs across hundreds or thousands of locations. Uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, you guys, a couple uh, of comments already came out here around this 40% number, which is interesting, is I think it really is critical in terms of how you slice and dice that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, that sort of works uh, largely with uh, what we call considered purchase categories. So, these are things like major appliances, furniture, automotive, et cetera. 
Um, and you know, I would say virtually all of those uh, use and experience co-op in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, are they maximizing it? Absolutely not. Uh, if you were to look at uh, other categories like plumbers or you know these kinds of service businesses who don't really have product brands, there's nobody to provide right. them co-op. So a large portion of small businesses fall into the category where there just is no co-op flowing through their system at all. So I think what would be interesting is to really drive into what are the mm -hmm. categories that have co-op available and then what's the sort of usage pattern there, right. which I know some of your data gets to, which is really interesting. It does. So yeah. actually, that's a that's a question I have for Tim. When we talk about the co-op opportunity, there are really three different buckets of funds. So there's co-op, there's brand network, and there's market development. Mm -hmm. So can you explain the differences between the three, and where is the bulk of the opportunity for us in this room? Yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah, we could spend the entirety of a day going through co-op advertising and, and its different application in different industries. But you have to realize that co-op's been around for a long, long time. You know, the first documented co-op program was actually from Warner, Warner Lingerie back in the 1880s for its corset line. So, you know, essentially what you end up with is as this has evolved over time, it falls under a, uh, an umbrella with most manufacturers called trade promotion, which is just really a catch-all term for all of the, the reseller promotion arrangements they make around the brands. And every industry and brand has kind of a different go-to-market strategy to loop in the resellers along these lines. So, you know, many of these have been around for a long time and have been tweaked to more or less acquiesce to what the dealer is currently doing. And as Steve and I talked about beforehand, if you tweak one of these co-op programs, it affects hundreds if not thousands of dealers nationwide who already have this baked into budgets that make it difficult to maneuver. But, you know, at its baseline, co-op advertising is just a box around this solution. So it, uh, it provides what manufacturers call an accrual, which is how you earn money into this budget to expend through your local media eligibility. And the manufacturers will put a box around that to say, well, we'll pay you this for this, and more or less a participation on different media spend. Um, and, you know, this isn't exactly the wild, wild west. There is governance around this stuff. So the robinson Patman Act and Sherman Act are more or less the ones who govern, you know, baseline for everybody gets this. You know, if you offer it to one, you have to offer it to others. And more recent legislation with like Sarbanes-Oxley kind of provide accounting rules on how you have to measure this and, and monitor at a manufacturer level, which is, you know, these are millions and millions of dollar budgets. Um, so co-op has, you know, co-op advertising has the, the rule set around it, specific earnings, specific, specific structures, specific time frames, where market development funding is more specially arranged around dealer activities and, and customized to, you know, specific dealer product movement strategies and KPIs around that with the manufacturer to actually move the inventory and have better measurements around it. When you look at um, dealer networks, it's more or less manufacturer authorized programs, kind of like Steve's, that you know kind of set aside a specific budget for this and a specific set of circumstances for the dealers to opt into these programs. But essentially what it boils down to with all of these is kind of three different C's uh, in how to manage trade promotion from a manufacturer side. The first is communication, letting these guys know what it is, the who, what, when, where, why of it all. Second is compliance, all of the brand rules, the brand advertising strategies, the right logo, the right romance copy, the right imagery surrounding the brand mm -hmm. in order to meet brand standards. And then there's claiming. The dealers have to pay for that advertising locally and then submit a rebate claim back to the manufacturer with all of the documentation in order to get reimbursed in that process. So it's okay. complicated, but we could spend days on it. So actually, that entire discourse uh, is a perfect example, I think, of why on the publisher side, so many people don't use co-op. So one, just the explanation of the different types, and the three Cs are actually really hard to follow. So as a former publisher, I have had co-op salespeople and co-op managers, and it was a struggle to get people to, one, use the tools, or to, two, actually take the offers out to, to their clients. Well, yeah, and one last point on that is 
many or most brands that you know have some go-to-market strategy involving co-op to a degree, but Ford's co-op program is completely different than GM's co-op program, which is completely different than Allstate Insurance or Ace Hardware or mm -hmm. Marvin Windows. So yeah. to know co-op is just to know sure. that there's a structure around it, and then you have to figure out the details. Right, and if you don't have a segmented sales staff, somebody has to know that all of that's available. So, um, Brennan, you and I were talking a little bit earlier. I think there are a couple uh, disconnects between brands and between SMBs or the people who sell co-op. So one is that uh, brands think that their programs are very easy, and I think you, you might agree. But I think that the people who are actually feet on the street, they don't think it's easy. They both agree that they're generally unaware of what's out there for them. So they do agree on that. The other inconsistency is the allocation of budget. So as, as, as we move forward in the d digital age, uh, we'd like to see more dollars allocated to digital. But a, a big portion of dollars is still uh, weighted towards traditional media. So we, we had a conversation about this a little bit earlier. How do we change that? How do we shift those dollars? Uh, can anyone solve Mitty's piece? <laughs> the, uh, it's, it's a difficult problem, and I think largely, you know, Tim mentioned mm -hmm. uh, it's been around for a long time. So right. co-op and cooperative marketing is not something that's new. One of the problems that we're having right now is a big shift from traditional media usage to digital channels is upon us, and only mm -hmm. about 25% of that money has been spent digital. Um, has to do with the fact that they've been around forever. And so these are programs that are built for a pre-digital age. And if you put yourself in the shoes of a small business owner in, you know, in a market across the street, you know, wor working to, to uh, support your three employees and your little bit of overhead, and you're trying to figure out, well, how do I do this? Uh, that person's life was very different just a few years ago. The sum total of their marketing effort mm -hmm. was meeting with their Yellow Pages rep once a year and deciding, to, uh, is this the year I go from a sixteenth of a page to an eighth of a page, right? right. Uh, maybe they did the occasional newspaper ad. It was also very easy for the brand because the brand at that point in time, all they had to do was receive that fax over the fax machine that showed the proof of the thing that that local business wanted to run and they could look at it and whatever it was was exactly what would run if right. they approved it. And they literally used a rubber stamper in some cases to say approved and faxed it back. And that local guy says, okay, I know I'm going to get my 50 cents back on the dollar. If I run this, I call my rep and say, go ahead and run it just as it was. Mm -hmm. There's almost no possibility of that small business screwing up the brand, right? Right. Because everyone knows exactly what's going to happen. Imagine what that world is like today. So here's that same business owner. He's getting 16 to 17 calls every month from people offering him various marketing services. Right. He doesn't know what to do. There are 20 digital channels he has to figure out. He's got to be his own content publisher. He's got to figure out. He hasn't even figured out how to get a good website going yet. And now we're telling him, forget all that. You got to go mobile. So, I mean, these guys, they can't move at that pace. So they're looking for guidance. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sort of prerequisites to your question, in my mind, in terms of how do we get this moving faster, one comes from you have to have this sort of unbelievable amount of courage and boldness at the brand level. Right. The brand has to lead the charge. Now the brands have long thought of their local uh, retail channels as those that do the sales and marketing. And we'll sort of co-fund some of the marketing, but that's what they do. It's ugly, it's sticky, it's messy, I don't want to deal with it. I want to produce a great product, I want to ship it to them from my warehouse and I want them to sort of do the rest. Well, they now those poor people at the local level, there's too many too, too much stuff coming at them, right? Too many options. And so the brand, and where we've seen the most success, so this is sort of evidence-based, not just opinion, is when the brand takes a stand. And they say, man, we're gonna move to digital. So you mentioned Ford, Tim, a minute ago. Uh, you know, Ford puts a requirement on their deal. If they wanna unlock co-op, mm -hmm. they have to spend a certain percentage of their marketing in digital channels. That's right. That's taking a stand. And they have right? to use approved vendors, which That's right. helps with the process. Mm -hmm. So they're streamlining it and they're driving uh, people to a mm -hmm. uh, smaller set of decisions, right? So the tyranny of choice that we all live with as consumers every day, these business owners are living that vis-a-vis -vis co-op uh, in, in a huge way. So that step one, get the brands to really take a stand. Step two, those brands have to then educate and pre-qualify in some cases, drive some credibility of partnerships and, and providers into their channels. And if you can get that done, then I think you have the opportunity to unlock it. 
there's still a whole bunch of work to be done because it's very that last mile is still very messy, right. but at least that would set the stage for unlocking it. So we talked a little bit about CERTA and how they have been slowly reallocating dollars or moving towards digital, mm -hmm. but it's not a quick process. And even though they really have ownership of, of how to allocate dollars, they are slow to move. Yeah. And I think that ties back, Kim, to you that if you change one thing in the program, it just impacts thousands of people uh, across the country. So tell us a little bit about CERTA and, and what they're doing and how they're really pushing this through. Sure. So CERTA is a brand that you're probably all familiar with, one of the largest uh, mattress manufacturers in the world. And we've been working with them for three or four years, and so this is where it takes some time. Uh, and they experimented a lot. They tried a lot of things with us through small numbers of their retailers at first. And then we began to run evergreen marketing for them that they fundamentally endorsed, right? So they said, look, NetServe is a platform you should be on, Mr. Retailer. Come here, we've got some predefined programs that are all set for you, and you just have to choose your sort of budget level, what are the categories you want to go after, and do you want to run you know, display, do you want to run retargeting, do you want to run search, do you want to run pre-roll video, do you want to do you know, business presence management, wh whatever you want to do, you just pick it and it's done. And uh, we, we use the term sort of, uh, we cheekily call pre-imbursement, um, because in some cases there is no reimbursement. The brand will pay up front as long as they have the three C's, right? Primarily if they have the control. So once they've established they're gonna get control and they think they're gonna get a return, they don't mind paying in advance. And that then solves a cash flow issue for the local guy. So we started uh, doing those types of things, you know, three or four years ago. Well, that evolved and I'll, I'll just fast forward. Um, all of a sudden, CERTA started to see the results and they widened it from you know, the first couple dozen, three or four dozen retailers to hundreds of their retailers. And now we're running evergreen marketing for hundreds of their retailers around the country. Uh, and then CERTA came up with this thing internally. So this is where the courage comes in. Uh, they came up with a mantra internally. And this is a mattress company, guys, right? This is not a technology <laughs> first kind of company. Uh, they, their mantra they came up with was called digital or die. And they wanted to have something short and poignant that they could use for the next two or three, four years with their retail channel to really communicate if you are not moving swiftly into digital channels, you will not survive, right? So people come through the digital door first and only then are you, know, are you likely to get them over your physical threshold. And so this sort of really just nailed it for them mm -hmm. and set the stage for them to drive bigger programs. And ultimately, now we run all their evergreen uh, things that are just ongoing, but now they can come in and they can push a button through NetSertive and they can light up, for example, a promotion that might happen you know, eight or nine times a year that's special sale or rebate or whatever it might be and run that to hundreds of locations, 100% uh, brand compliant. Um, they'll put, uh, through our cloud servers, they can, th they can actually drive the brand approved content into the retailer's website associated with the offer so they know the consumer is going to see the right information, get the rebate, use the code, whatever it might be. Uh, with all that control um, and all that capability and that little bit of courage they put behind it, mm -hmm. they've got now hundreds of retailers involved. And they're really, I, I think that relative to a lot of other folks that we work with in industries that are in the technology field and think they might be out in front, here's a brand that's really taken the ball and run with it. And right. uh, as a result, they're, they're having amazing results. Okay, so you talked about website and we do know that a lot of digital dollars that are available are available for presence for websites. So Steve, that's a space that you play in and you actually are very niche uh, in, in your offering and how you work with brands. So tell us a little bit about uh, how you do that and how you get corporate approval and how you execute locally. Sure, so um, in general, Pair works across a lot of different industries. It's not all co-op. So we're used to as a company working at more of the corporate level, the brand level. So that's, that tends to be where we start. So we recently did a program with all that's now ongoing and growing from there. And the way we, we worked it is start at the corporate level, set the overall strategy, show them how it's going to grow the business and how it's relevant at the local level. And essentially the way they saw it is it's almost a lead generation tool for their local agents in the markets who it makes it turnkey for them to sponsor local groups, which is, by the way, something these local agents are already doing. They're just having to do it kind of one-off. These local groups will come to them, wh who knows when they'll come, and who knows what they're gonna get from it, but they, they do it because they wanna support the community. So we basically brought a program that's very turnkey for them. It makes it a very seamless platform they can roll out to all the agents. It also guarantees engagement as part of the sponsorship. So we, we package this all at the corporate level, 
And then the trick was, how do we package this up, just like Tim and Brendan have been talking about, how do you make it really easy and turnkey at the local level? Because it can't be this very complicated program. It almost has to be a menu, like you're talking about, you can pick from. So it's, a, it's almost a tactic at the local level. So we spent a lot of time on how do we simplify this program, make it as simple, turnkey as possible at the local level. So that was a big part of it. And the other part of it was how do we make sure we have those incentives so that the agents will be especially excited to do it. And so corporate, you know, essentially is matching um, whatever the co-op local level will spend on it. So when you kind of combine, it fits the brand at a strategic level. It's the program is built and designed to essentially drive meaningful results at the local level. And then you tie it together in a very simple, easy to activate package with that added incentive of you're going to get your, ma your whatever money you put in, you're going to get matched with corporate. And then you're that much more incentivized to run yeah. it. So for, for all of you, I know there are people in this room who have called me to say, help me get co-op dollars. Introduce me to brand managers. Give me your co-op database. What's your advice to anybody in the room who wants to try to get co-op dollars? How do you start, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> Leading question. Well, you, um, sit, you, I mean, you sit at the top of the funnel, right? Right. So well, mm, well, one thing you really have to remember is there's a question on who actually owns the co-op dollars. You know, these are percentages of sales that local businesses have made with the brands that they consider their funding for their advertising, whether they use it or not. So it's not a question of um, uh, application to digital. It's one bucket of money, however the dealer feels, is the best way to move inventory to his store. Where to start depends on what vertical you're in and what market you want to be in. Um, are you approaching this nationally like Brendan is, or are you approaching it in Philadelphia? Okay. You said something that's interesting to me. So a dealer can actually determine allocation of funds? Um, so I have a bucket and I can spend 100% on, on digital? Yep. yep. Okay. Is that What's easy for them? Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say it's uh, yes, and it depends. So mm -hmm. the, the rule sets get applied differently based on the brand and what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Right. Future so yeah. Whirlpool has a, a selection of a dozen different media opportunities, including in-store, that right. they can apply their co-op money to. Um, several of them are digital, but it's up to the dealer to choose what's the best for his store. Well, this feels a lot easier than solving world peace if it's at the dealer level, and they just say, "Hey, here's here's where I want to spend." Dealt my with these dealers? Here's where I want to <laughs> spend I, my money. I, I didn't suggest world peace. I was just starting with the Mideast. east. Oh, think yeah. Yeah. okay. Okay, yeah. world peace. I maybe oversimplified. Okay. I, I my answer to your question is, uh, and obviously this is the way we've gone about it. But I, to me, this space is so big, tens of billions of dollars floating around in local marketing, well, 150 billion local marketing, mm -hmm. right? Tens of billion in co-op at least 10 or 12, maybe 15 or more billion in unredeemed co-op, which right. is what you're getting at. Um, and how do you go after that? To me, you have to focus. So you either focus on a geography or you, you do something, you figure out what works for you to focus. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're gonna figure out if you have you know, 30 different customer types and you're gonna try to go figure out the co-op rules up and down the chain across right. those 30 different business types, I think you're going to fail. I think you have to figure out what your niche is going to be, where you're going to play, and really understand those. Um, you know, uh, folks in automotive have done this to great effect for years. They're That's sort right. of the leaders in, in that in terms of digital solutions applied to automotive only. Uh, there are a few other examples. Um, our view was go to the brand first, mm -hmm. get that endorsement, but mostly really understand what their requirements were. Get to the you know, Whirlpool 62 page Word document that changes every quarter that goes right. to each one of those retailers. Be able to distill that, understand it, and deliver that through technology so that the ind individual retailers can just turn something on. And yeah. I think that's the only way to do it is through some, some form of focus. So automotive is a great example. Who, who drove the digital force for the automotive category? Was it manufacturers? Was it the dealers? Was it both of them working in partnership? Because right now, I think automotive is the one category where they do require, they mandate, at least 50% of spend go to digital. So how does that happen for other categories? Well, it was pretty obvious that digital was going to steer the ship. For so it's based on ROI. Yeah. Um, 
and they they're early adopters because they have the money to do so. Right. The average auto dealer will move about 800 vehicles, new vehicles in a year, which equates to about $250,000 in local co-ops to promote those just off 800 vehicles. And that's not including certified pre-owned programs or parts and service programs that add to that fee. Right. So you've got a lot more resources than bread and appliance right. to try to figure out a new category of business. Okay. Steve, from your perspective. Um, yeah, I mean, for for us, it's always been about working at the brand level because that's what we've been comfortable with, and that's where we've seen the changes kind of come down from. We found that there's a little higher level of sophistication at the brand level versus the local level. I mean, kind of to your comment earlier, the brands have marketing teams. They have agencies they're working with. The local levels don't just don't have the same resources, and they have a lot more on their plate to focus on. So what we found works the best, especially with a technology like ours, it's, it is very unique, it's very different. Mm -hmm. um, there's a niche element to it. It's, it started for us with educate at the corporate level about what, what do we do in the first place? How is it gonna deliver business results? How does it fit into the rest of the puzzle? I mean, it's, at its heart, it's another digital and social platform. Right. So educating them on that, and then how is it gonna drive the local business, and being able to take that story down to the local level has been what's worked best for us, and that's how we've seen the change come. But you know, it, it, at the end of the day, we have seen that there, there often is a barrier between, you know, in the digital world, you wanna move quickly, you wanna be flexible. The co-op mm -hmm. system is not necessarily built for that. So there can be a lot of barriers along the way. I mean, even getting the corporate level and the co-op level on the same page right. is not always easy. So there are a lot of barriers along the way to making that change. But so our approach, at least, has been start at the corporate level and then kind of work our way down. And then push down. Okay, good. I'll give you one more example. So this is at the other extreme in terms of where they are on this adoption continuum. Um, in the IT B2B space, so large global IT brands, hardware and software, uh, we've begun working with over the course of the last year. Um, we started taking a look at that space and, and quickly learned that a small single digit percentage of the marketing spent at the local level is, was in digital channels. Now, these are the IT behemoths, right? right? The technology people not using digital at all. And it turns out that their rules are much more flexible. So they have whatever they want to call it, co-op, MDF, reimbursements, et cetera. They have uh, you know, amount, amounts of money, but the local integrator in that space can sort of just decide. I'm gonna run this event, or I'm gonna do this thing, or I'm right. gonna put up a banner, or whatever it might be. Um, and so they have the less stringent rules, but also they're not leading that channel into the digital world. Right. So it was interesting, they didn't have the rule framework that was as stringent as major appliances or automotive, but they could turn a dial and say, we want you to start doing you know, this much in digital. And so what we found is we're putting those types of uh, you know, channel leaders together with uh, folks from companies like Serta that, we, that we've worked with and having them hear the story. Mm -hmm. And then here's all these technology guys sitting in a room at one of our you know, client advisory boards going, oh, ho hold on a second, the mattress guy is like outflanking me in digital? Like right. I, I gotta go talk to him. Right. Uh, and so I think those are the kinds of things it's gonna take to really wake them up and show them the possibilities and, and, and let them then lead the charge. And one question I'd have for you actually is with CERTA, you've got some major players who are their retail base. How much did the, did the tail wag the dog in how your process worked with them? I mean, did it slow it down? Yeah, so just to clarify, there's this you know, sort of large retailers and how much influence are they having and whether or not to do certain things, yeah. So we've seen it both ways. We've, we've actually seen that some large uh, retailers, actually some that aren't even that large, but tend to have a massive influence at the brand level, um, we've used that as a way to get to the brand. So we've actually used that leverage to go, we're running all their marketing and boy, they have a voice with you, Let, let's all three of us sit down and talk about what we can do for your entire network. Um, and then on, on the other hand, if the large uh, retailers at the local level do exert a lot of influence, but for some reason we're not sort of on board at first, right, with the brand's program, then you know, they can be accepted out of it in some cases. So you're talking about small numbers of a hundreds or thousands of, you know, in a retail mm -hmm. network. Um, so yeah, sometimes they will make special exceptions to let them out of it. Gotcha. And you know, we could ask Pete, you know, how he how he approaches co-op, but I would assume that the reason that AC Delco is featured in those stores is not because they love them. There you go. Well, it's business, right? So I don't know that we have time for uh, for any questions. So. Uh, 
I'll summarize by saying I think there are three key things. One, the dealers want you to make it easy. So make it easy, let us know what's available, and let us spend more money on, on digital. I think those are the three key takeaways. Okay, very good. Well, thank you guys for joining us today.